All right, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Occult Perspectives. Um, this is actually um, my second video um, I'm, I'm going to try and do today. Um, I did Zelda Part 4 um, just about 20 minutes ago or so, and I'm going to go ahead and do another Dante video. I think I'm on Part 5 um, now. Um, or video five of my Dante series, um, The Divine Comedy. If you haven't watched those yet, I would go back and watch the other four or five, however many there are, um, before watching this. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start. I think I left off, it took me four videos to just kind of cover the background of um, The Divine Comedy, a little bit of Dante's history, and we're gonna go ahead and start off from Canto 2, I think is where we left off. And I'm gonna make it um, as far through this video as I can. Um, just kind of a lazy day for me, not doing too much, just kind of sitting around the house and such. Okay, Canto 2. Um, so it's the next evening of the journey for Dante. The muses are nine sisters. It's because in the very beginning, it says there's an invocation to the muses. The day was now departing. The dark air released the living beings of the earth from work and weariness, and I myself alone prepared to undergo the battle, both of the journeying and of the pity, which memory mistaking not shall show. O oh, muses, O oh, high genius, help me now. O oh, memory that set down what I saw here, shall your excellence reveal itself. Okay, let me find that note. Canto two notes. Yeah. The start of the journey, Virgil's account of Beatrice's vis visit to Limbo. Um, it's kind of the summary of Canto two. Um, the muses are the nine sisters to whom classical poets appealed as if for external inspiration and assistance. This invocation shows Dante's awareness of the epic poetic task that is ahead of him, for which he will need also the full powers of his own inventive genius. Okay. O oh, muses, O oh, high genius, I quoted in the notes. It's interesting that he puts it that way. Lines 14 to 15, an analogy to Aeneas' journey to Hades, the underworld. Let's see what's written there. You say that he who fathered Silvius while he was still corruptible had journeyed into the deathless world with his live body. I'm guessing the one who fathered Silvius, they're referring to Aeneid, or Aeneas. I guess. The Aeneid is the name of the book, but Aeneas is the character. Silvius, his son, and heir by Lavinia, joined together the Trojan and the Latin races. So that's a side note of some historical context. I try not to cover the Roman historical stuff as much as the actual esoteric notes in here. So let's see. Um, see if the force in me is strong enough. Sounds just like Star Wars. I wrote that in my notes. Where is that at? In the classical example of student asking if they are worthy enough. To the deathless world with his own. Oh, here we go. After the, um, after the invocation of the muses, Dante says, um, I started, poet you who are my guide, see if the force in me is strong enough before you let me face that rugged pass. This is Dante talking to Virgil. So this d is kind of reminiscent of Star Wars. I wonder if George Lucas kind of got the idea from the Divine Comedy. Um, you say that he who fathered Silvius while he was still corruptible. We just talked about, we just covered that. Um, and yeah, it's, it is a classical example of a student asking if they are worthy enough. You know, Anakin's always asking Obi-Wan, is 
you know, is the force strong enough in me? Um, the student's usually asking that. But then Anakin gets really proud, and of course we see what happens to him um, in the Star Wars story. Mm, line 16. For if the enemy of every evil was courteous to him, the enemy of evil, every evil is God, it says in the notes. So that's kind of interesting. Um, if the enemy of every evil was courteous to him, considering all he would cause and who and what he was. That does not seem incomprehensible. In line 18, I write, destined by God to form Rome. So they're talking about the empire and the church, you know, or being destined to be formed. If God was courteous to him, considering all he would cause, so then he must be talking about Aeneas still, and who and what he was, that does not seem incomprehensible. Since in the Empyrean heaven, he was chosen to father to honor Rome honored Rome in her empire. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, and if the truth be told, Rome and her realm were destined to become the sacred place, the seat of the successor of great Peter. Destined by God to be formed. Um, because this is a reoccurring theme in the Divine Comedy. It's all about this divine authority, you know, that... Um, like Dante is even allowed to go into the um, afterlife and have this spiritual journey and experience. A lot of the um, spirits that are there are confused or they get upset because he's able to do that. <clears throat> Empyrean heaven, definition. I feel my life is ordained from this, all the beauty I have beheld. I'm not sure why I wrote that. All he would cause the foundation of the room, the center of the empire and the church, we said. In the Empyrean heaven by God, in the infinite heaven beyond the nine spheres known as the Empyrean, meaning filled with fire, that is, with God's light and love. Um, so yeah, I think working with um, like ritual magic and stuff and whatever you know spiritual practices are, it brings you to that understanding of that that almighty like heaven that um, exists beyond the borders and the layers of a structure it's like it's it's the all it's the infinite wisdom it's the einsoft or it's that which is beyond everything um it just starts getting really crazy once you start um perceiving it from that level of understanding really trying to figure it out um, but nine beyond the nine spheres so it would be beyond the nine sephirot on the tree of life known as the Empyrean, meaning filled with fire. And that's interesting because the Seraphim are known as the fiery ones, and they even cannot look upon the face of God because um, we'll see that as we get into Paradiso way later on. But it's just that whole theme of fire being the highest you know, realm and such. Um, line 24, we talked about the great Peter. The successor of great Peter the Pope, head of the Universal Church, whose authority was transmitted from Christ's appointment of St. Peter at the Rock, or the foundation of the church. Matthew, quote. Um, I kind of disagree with a lot of the Catholic sentiments, though, that it's really just, that it's gone down the line of people and hasn't become corrupted at some point. So it's more, at this point, and where we are on the earth, it's more about the divine inner knowingness in our own souls. You know, um, we don't need like an outside authority other than source itself because source is one with us. So we already have that authority. We just need to learn how to use it to take control over our own temples and to spread peace and love and not use these powers to control others or to um, to hurt anybody. You know, it's um, we want to use this understanding for good, for love and for peace. <clears throat> well, Let's see uh, how much more I can get through here real quick. Just because someone comes from a line of people, it's hard to prove. Of course, is what I was saying before. Everyone has equal access to reach the Empyrean. You know, this un the universal true heaven that is within and without, as within, so without, as above, so below. Um, I wrote line 28. This is a very important note on the journeys of St. Paul. 
Let's see. Leader of the chosen vessel traveled there to bring us back assurance of that faith with which the way to our salvation starts. The chosen vessel, as we just mentioned, St. Paul, one of the first preachers of Christianity and writer of the epistles who was chosen by God to be filled with his words and spirit, um, quote Acts. St. Paul tells how he was taken up to a vision of heaven and its mysteries to Corinthians. <clears throat> An apocryphal work, the vision of Paul, which told of a journey by him to hell also, was a major influence on Christian vision literature before Dante and on the medieval image of hell and its torments. So that's an er even, usually Dante is kind of the first, Inferno is the first thing people go to when they think of the typical medieval, you know, stereotype or archetype of hell. But this is an even earlier version that they're talking about here. The vision of Paul. I've never read that. So that's kind of interesting. It's more apocryphal text. Okay, let me try to get a little bit further and then I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap this video up. I haven't really eaten much today. I'm getting kind of hungry. Let's see. Dante questions if his journey is truly ordained by God, line 35. Because he's questioning it, he's like, um, but why should I go there who sanctions it? For I am not Aeneas, if not Paul, nor I nor others think myself so worthy. Therefore, if I consent to start this journey, I fear my venture may be wild and empty. You're wise, you know far more than what I say, and just as he who unwills what he wills and shifts what he intends to seek new ends, he's talking about God, so that he's drawn from what he had begun. So was I in the midst of that dark land, because with all my thinking, I annulled the task I had so quickly undertaken. Okay, so that took us to like line 43. Um, wild and empty, rash. So, is it, what are you saying? I fear my venture may be wild and empty. Rash and presumptuous, unlike the divinely authorized visits to the afterlife of Aeneas and St. Paul, who had special roles in God's plan to create the empire and the church. Um, that great-hearted one. If I had understood, if I have understood what you said, replied the shade of the great-hearted one. Oh, no, I'll go ahead and... That was the end of the, um, of what Dante was talking about. Dante shifting views and being, he's in darkness. Um, cowardice distracts man from his honorable trials. I wrote a note in there. <clears throat> Did I go ahead too much? Yeah, let me just read the next line then, and then I'll go ahead and finish up this video. And they're talking about God. And just as he who unwills what he wills and shifts what he intends to seek new ends so that he's drawn from what he had begun, so was I in the midst of that dark land. You know, we're talking about symbolic darkness here. Um, anyone who's uh, like vibrationally in that place of, of darkness. Because with all my thinking, I annulled the tasks I had so quickly undertaken. If I have understood what you said, have said, replied the shade of the great hearted one, Virgil. Your soul has been assailed by cowardice, which often weighs so heavily on a man, distracting him from honorable, tr honorable trials, as phantoms frighten beasts when shadows fall. That you may be delivered from this fear, I'll tell you why I came and what I heard when I first felt compassion for your pain. I was among those souls who are suspended. A lady called to me, so blessed, so lovely, that I implored to serve at her command. Her eyes surpassed the splendor of the stars, and she began to speak to me so gently and softly with angelic voice. She said, O oh spirit of the courteous Manchuan, whose fame is still a presence in the world and shall endure as long as the world lasts, my friend who has not been the friend of fortune, is hindered in his path along that lonely hillside. He has been turned aside by terror. From all that I have heard of him in heaven, he is, I fear, already so astray that I have come to help him much too late. Go now with your persuasive word, with all that is required to see that he escapes. Bring help to him that I may be consoled. For I am Beatrice, I am Beatrice who send you on. I come from where I most long to return, source, Cather, the Empyrean, heavenly Empyrean. Love prompted me that love which makes me speak. 
when once again I stand before my Lord, then I shall often let him hear your praises. Now Beatrice was silent, and I began. So um, this is the part where Beatrice, Virgil talks about his encounter with Beatrice, and she's the one um, that's really come from on high to save Dante's soul. And this is, this is why it's so beautiful. Um, the love, the love of a woman. Um, it's an amazing thing. You know, divine, the divine feminine, feminine mother love is being personified by Beatrice, um, the Virgin Mary, and um, the love of God, um, which is beyond all dualities. Um, but it's this chain of, of divine female authorities. Um, yep, Mother Mary, Beatrice, and um, also the other Saint Lucia as well. I think that pretty much covers up um, everything for now. Which line did that take me to? Line 70. Beatrice's eyes surpassed the stars, and she had an angelic voice. More description there. Um, it said in there, which was really beautiful. Limbo, desire without hope. What is that? I was among those souls who are suspended. A lady called to me because Virgil was stuck in limbo and it's just kind of weird and odd that he's I don't really agree with that I've talked in previous Dante videos about kind of the weird viewpoints on that and where it's like how even everyone's gonna return to ultimate source it doesn't matter if you were pagans you know we work towards being good people and we um, clean up our karma and stuff and um, you know we just transmute and transcend everything Let's see what else is in here. Those souls who are suspended, the souls in limbo, the first circle of hell who desire without hope. Um, the lady who came to talk to him, Beatrice, usually identified as the daughter of the Florentine philanthropist, Falco Portinari. She was celebrated in Dante's youthful poems and the Vita Nuova as the lady through whom he acquired an understanding of love as a rational, selfless, virtuous, and ultimately redemptive force. She died at the age of 24 in June 1290, and Dante's poems after her death present her as a blessed soul in paradise. Um, Manchuan, she said, man of Manchuan earlier, Virgil born near Manchua in northern Italy. Um, my friend Dante, who has loved Beatrice constantly despite the vicissitudes of fortune, which has also treated him badly through his exile with Florence. Even through trials, you know, harsh trials, Dante's love has always been pure. Um, love described as a redemptive force, a, a blessed soul in paradise is what, um, you know, Beatrice has moved on to in Dante's story. And that's it's that idea of noble love, as we've talked about in videos before, I've brought that up quite a bit. Um, and we'll talk more about that because it gets deeper into the philosophy of what true divine love is as we progress through the divine comedy. Um, what else is here real quick? Okay, I got to about line 70, so we'll go ahead and stop there. Um, Beatrice thought she had come much too late. Um, come for where I must long to return, which is sort of... Alrighty. Yep, paradise. That I had said, Kether, Source, or the Empyrean. And lo love prompted Beatrice, of course. 74, I shall often let him hear your praises. When once again I stand before my Lord, then I shall often let him hear your praises. I think she's talking about Virgil if, she, if he helps, you know, her um, mission of reaching to Dante and redeeming his soul. Essentially, she'll praise Virgil in, in heaven to God and, and say that, hey, this man really helped me in my time of need. So, alrighty, I think that's it for this video. So that takes us from now we're in Canto 2 of Inferno. And we've made it to about line 70. Um, I'm reading from the Everyday Man's Library version, or it's called the Every the Every Man's Library version, um, Dante's Inferno. Um, I don't have the cover on here right now. It's just a naked hardback book. So, 
Um, I hope you are all um, getting a lot from these videos. I hope you enjoy them. Um, I hope everybody's taking care. Um, please like, um, please comment um, if you feel like you want to. Um, let me know which videos you like the most, the Dante stuff, the video game stuff, um, the um, ceremonial magic stuff. Um, I try to tie that in um, th thematically as well to as many videos as I can. So, alrighty, with that all said, um, peace and blessings, everyone, and take care.